love. Some would say it took a backseat when the pandemic forced us apart. As a family-run and proudly Canadian-owned company, Charm Diamond Centres saw the need to bring us together with tales of love and created the Canadian Love Map podcast. Since then, we've shared hundreds of real, uplifting stories that prove love conquers all. So thank you for listening. We couldn't do it without you. And remember, love starts here. Hi, I'm Nancy Regan. Thanks for tuning in. Over the summer months, the Canadian Love Map team is hard at work finding new stories for our upcoming seventh season. In the meantime, we're dipping into the vault to share some of our favorite episodes of all time. Enjoy this Love Map Gold. We'll be back with Season 7 in September. This is a true Canadian love story. We were meant to be together. I can't imagine my life without you. Honestly, he's a light of my life. It's nice to be in that tractor beam of love. I'm her biggest fan. I I think I knew I'd lost my heart again. I knew I wanted a marriage like that. Difficult roads can lead to very beautiful destinations. Well, love is the most important thing. Hi, I'm Nancy Regan. Welcome to the Canadian Love Map. This week's love story belongs to Dylan and Jen, two storytellers from British Columbia. Once upon a time, Jen was a model traveling the world, and Dylan was skating toward a hockey career. As so often happens, life had surprises in store for them. She became an actor and filmmaker, and he landed a role in one of Canada's most successful TV shows. So how did their journeys collide? You'll find out in this very entertaining episode. This is the Canadian Love Map. Jen and Dylan. I have never said this to a couple who were on our podcast before, but I keep hearing amazing things about you two as a couple. And I want to say you come highly recommended. Well, thank you. Oh, that that's, is uh, too sweet. It's a great vote of confidence to start the podcast. You have a lot of fans out there, both as individuals and as a couple. Looking from the outside, I would say that one thing you both certainly seem to have in common is that you're storytellers. So what I'd love for you to do is each tell me your story. So it'll bring our listeners up to date. For those who don't know your background, uh, let's hear your story. Who wants to start? Yeah. (laughs) Um, I'll start. Sure. Um, I started in the entertainment industry very young. So I started at 13 years old, actually, uh, with modeling. So I started uh, modeling in Europe, in New York, in Los Angeles. My mom would come with me during my school breaks. So I got, you know... Went deep in at a very young age, but I loved it. Um, And thank goodness my mom came with me because I think the industry can be a lot at a young age. And I'm thankful she came with me and she really taught me strong morals and to be, you know, independent. And um, it was real. It was really awesome. So after that, I moved to New York and was modeling and started acting and trained in New York City with a really, really great teachers, Alexander Neal, Nina Murano, and the Meisner Technique, and um, mm-hmm. did theater. So really jumped into storytelling, because since I was little, that's what I wanted to do. I saw The Wizard of Oz when I was a kid, and I probably watched it every single day until my parents <laughs> thought it was unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, you need to rent another movie at that time. It was Blockbuster. And I just be like, please, was it a vase? And they finally bought the movie. And then I was watching it so much. They're like, OK, I feel like she's a little obsessed. But I just remember watching that movie and thinking they made that magical world. She got to act like how amazing is that? And I was obsessed. So I as soon as I graduated high school, I knew I just wanted to jump into storytelling, but I knew modeling was something that could get me, you know, a visa and I could get in, um, my visa sponsored being a model, even though that wasn't really my personality. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, long story short, I, uh, 
jumped on the other side of the camera when I moved to Los Angeles and did a documentary because I was volunteering in Compton Inglewood area and saw a really big problem with the foster care system. And I thought, what better way to get the word out there, what's really going on in that area than doing a documentary. So I just jumped right in and found people to help me make it, found funding, and then that's when I realized why I love directing. I love being on the side of the camera. So now I do a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, It's an exciting life. Uh, Dylan. (laughs) Yeah. My my story. Yeah. Uh, What time do we got? It starts on ice, doesn't it? (laughs) It does. It starts on ice very much. So my, my father's a pro hockey coach. He coaches for the Edmonton Oilers and both my brothers uh, played junior hockey. My my middle brother is a uh, coach for the UBC Thunderbirds, and my youngest brother played in the Western League. I played in the BCHL. So all that to say, I grew up around hockey. My dad was coaching through minor leagues, and, and we moved a lot as a kid on his journey to the NHL. So I moved many, many times as he would go up from the East Coast League to the International League to the American League to eventually the, the NHL. So um I had to adapt quite a lot as me and my brothers would move into new schools and make new friends. And I always had uh, had a real love for, for comedy, for, um, for you know, funny movies and TV shows and making people laugh. And my, my parents both, thought, both had really great sense of humor. And I always thought after hockey, I would pursue film or, or acting. So my, my plan A was the NHL. My plan B was to become an actor, which looking back now is, is crazy. But, um, I think a little bit of that naivety is, is what you need in order to, to, to find success in some of these difficult industries. So when I was 19, I left hockey and moved to Vancouver to pursue a career in film. I ended up meeting Jared Kiso, who's the creative letter Kenny on a beer league team from, from around Vancouver. I was working behind the scenes, during the day as a production assistant and at night taking acting classes. So he, you know, heard my story and was very similar to him. And and he set me up with Carrie Wheeler, who is our agent. And, um, I, I had been acting for about eight, eight years, seven years. And I, I'd done, you know, I've been very fortunate. I, I'd, I'd done well in Canada and it was, it's my only real, real gig, but I had done a documentary on the, uh, on, on youth voter apathy in North America. So Jen had just signed with Carrie and mentioned to me that there was a new actress on her roster who had done a documentary and I had done a documentary and we should, we should meet each other. So I, uh, I came to a, a casual Thursday, which is these gatherings that our agent has. And I was figuring I'd come in and say hi real quick to, to Carrie and then, and then leave. And there was, you know, there was one seat next to Jen and uh, she mentioned that this girl had done a documentary as well. So I'm like, oh, I've done one. Let's, let's see how, how good her doc is. So I sat down next to her and um, I mean, a, a long story made very short is I parked into our parking thing. I'd be in and out really quickly. And that was around noon. And uh, we ended up closing out the bar. It wasn't until 2 AM that, that, that we left the the spot and uh, yeah, Jen and I just had so much in common. It was so easy to talk to her and uh, yeah, that, that's sort of my my story in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's great. So wait a second though. So you've got a great acting resume. Of course, you're well known now for your role in Letterkenny on Crave, and that got you into the Mighty Ducks franchise, which is so exciting. So you've worked with, uh, I know, lots of famous people. I think about Emilio Estevez on the Mighty Ducks now. And, and of course, you working with James Gandolfino and, uh, and have I said it right? Gandolfini? Oh, Gandolfini. Yeah. Yeah, you Gandolfini. I knew it was wrong as soon as I said it. And Henry, Henry Winkler. What mm. has working with really famous celebrities taught you about life? Hmm. Well, you know, I guess I'll go first. I um, I feel like I've had really, I'm really lucky, especially with James Gandolfini. He was more than he should have been on the show. He asked me consistently, if are you comfortable? Anything you need? He told me, you know, I bartended for years. No one told me I'd be a leading man. Never give up on your dreams. He was so inspiring. And it was my first dramatic television role. And I just 
didn't expect for him to come in and go way beyond what he should have. So he really inspired me to go for it. He tried to even set me up with his agent after and they're like, call us when you know you book a couple more things. They've got like <laughs> Brad Pitt, James Gettles, we need like the biggest people in Hollywood. Uh, but I feel like because I'd been surrounded by so many famous people since I was modeling at such a young age, and we, I always saw celebrities. It kind of desensitized me in a good way to remember that they're just human beings like everybody else. And um, I think that taught me a lot to also to see how other celebrities acted to know that like money and fame does not buy you happiness. You have to have so much more than that and kind of being introduced in this crazy world where I saw was had access to, you know, big, huge parties, you know, uh, fancy celebrities, this kind of life and seeing some that really uh, stayed grounded and humble and just how much they they seem so much happier. And that taught me a lot at a young age that you could have all of that, but that it certainly doesn't make you happy. And the ones that stood out and took the time and um, just, you know, wanted to be a good person. Those are the people that really stayed memorable in my heart, you know, for yeah. a long time. Yeah, yeah. I, mm-hmm. I totally second what, what Jen's saying. I mean, there's there's this common theme of appreciation amongst the, the celebrities who have stayed working for so long and who have, have stayed relevant. I mean, um, Betty White just passed away and Jen and I watched a, a documentary celebrating her mm-hmm. life. And, and, and a theme that kept coming up with her was this incredible sense of um, gratitude and appreciation for what she kept saying was, I get to do this. I, I get to do this. And I think when you when you interact with people who have done it for a long time and who have gotten to a place where they have a lot of fans and they have that awareness of, of how fortunate they are to be in that position, um, I think it creates a feedback loop where you get more of that opportunity because people recognize you as being appreciative of those opportunities. And I think as soon as you start to feel like um, you, you, it's, it's not, it's not that you deserve it because you do deserve it if you work hard, but there should always be a sense of gratitude. You know, there should always be a sense of I'm getting to do this thing that's very unique and very special. And I'm aware that we only get to do it because fans watch the stuff that we're, we're taking a part in. So, um, you know, the really famous people that I've seen have this aura about them where everyone feels special when they're on set and they make other people feel good. And, and I think that is a part of fame that a, a lot of people don't get to see because they see the finished product on TV or on the screen and they go, Oh, they're, they're these, you know, untouchable idols, but they, they, they build that reputation by making people around them feel better. And that to me is such a cool thing to have been exposed to early in my career is these really successful actors who make you feel very, very comfortable. And I think the world's changed now with social media where if you do something good, it, it, it is spread. But if you do something negative, it's spread twice as fast. So there's, you know, of course, being a good person, you want to make people feel good, but also, you know, your, your career will be a lot more healthy if you, uh, if you appreciate the opportunities you're given. Yeah, you know, there's something in what you just said that reminds me of The Wizard of Oz, picking up on what uh, Jen used to watch every day, a couple times a day. Um, And that is that uh, my experience of interviewing famous celebrities when I used to broadcast and host a show was I would do movie junkets. And what it taught me is that we're all the same. We're Mm -hmm. all human. Mm -hmm. And, you know, behind the Wizard of Oz is the just the human being. And what I keep hearing about both of you is despite your uh, extraordinary success and the profile you've got, how grounded you are. So that's that's a tribute to you. I now have to hear your love story. You, You told me the first part, but where did it go from there? (laughs) <laughs> uh, when you left that parking spot at 2 a.m where did right. I go from there well Dylan was a gentleman he he you know I took an uber so he he dropped me off um at home and um you know it, it was at that that night that it was like almost unbelievable because we had so much in common everything from our families um to our careers to just like how we look at the world so I it, it didn't take long like that night he already text me to set up another date. 
<laughs> and he was such a gentleman again. He picked me up, did the movie, dinner, didn't even give me a kiss, was such a gentleman, like um, really wanted to show me he was, you know, serious about getting to know me. And um, that night we closed down the restaurant and then we sat outside my apartment just talking in the car, I think, till like two in the morning. He even played his harmonica for me. <laughs> wow. Yes. That's good. It was uh, very I just smooth. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wooed her with my harmonica skills. <laughs> yeah, pretty much uh, since then we were inseparable. Like we, we just, it was one of those things that it wasn't something that was an effort. We just like couldn't help it. We just felt so quick in love with each other. And we tried to play it cool for a while, you know, and try not to, you know, let spill the beans, but we both knew, you yeah, know, it, it what was, was it going was very, on. <laughs> it was just very, very easy, you know, and something mm-hmm. that I mentioned to my family when I first started dating Jen was there's, there's never a moment where I feel like there's something we we just talk about anything and everything and you start a conversation at you know two in the afternoon and next thing you look at the clock and it's two in the morning and I think that's you know that that's a foundation to build a, a relationship on and then a life on it and it's something that Jen and I have always really prided ourselves on is our ability to communicate and we're both we're both very expressive and I mean I, I could I could listen to her you know, re- re- read the instruction manuals off the back of a friggin' toaster. I just love, love hearing her, her thoughts and her perspectives. And, you know, I, I know personally, I feel, I feel better about myself when I'm with her and, and, and the conversations we have, you know, I think they make, we make each other better and, and there's never a, a, a lack of communication and there's always something exciting to, to talk about and there's always something fun to do. And, you know, um, to have your best friend as, as your life partner, it's a, it's a very special, very special opportunity. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm just very, very lucky to, to have her. Yeah, we feel grateful. It wasn't always like this prior for me, no. I'll say that. No. Which I'm thankful for those past relationships because it brought me to Dylan. But I finally was like, wow, OK, now now I know what, you know, this is like, I really appreciate our relationship because I've been through other relationships where wasn't right you know so yeah it's, it's been great those yeah. are mulligans mm-hmm. exactly, exactly. Right? this podcast is brought to you by charm diamond centers canada's largest family-owned jewelry store they are proud to be putting love on the map. And the staff at Charm Diamond Centers are thrilled to be a part of your love story, too. So visit CharmDiamondCenters.com or one of your local stores. Love starts here. Was there a moment when you knew that you wanted this other person to be your life partner? Um, it, It's funny because I've been asked this question before and... You know, when I when I went ring shopping with my my mom came down to Vancouver to, to help me pick out a ring and um, it was it was less of a moment where I went, OK, this is it. And it was more just so very clearly it wouldn't be anyone else. You know, we had we really organically and I think it was also part of our resistance to jump in too fast. We, we didn't want to we would both come out of relationships and we were both in a place where we really wanted to, you know, work on ourselves and and be very stable with with who we were and i think that was part of the reason why we we fit so well was because we had come to the same place in our lives and then the thought of 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 not you know waking up with with jen and and spending every day with her was just there there was no world where i felt that any other person would make sense and i just they say when you when you know you know Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it, it wasn't really a decision to be made. It was kind of a very obvious step of, well, of course, mm-hmm. we're going to spend our lives together. I, I, I couldn't be with anyone else. And then we yeah. had the conversation and it was mutual. Yeah. And I think, too, for me, the moment that really like I knew for myself, but the moment that it really validated it for me is Dylan came. I'm from Kelowna originally, and he came to meet my whole family for the first time. And it was like he'd 
been in our family for so long already. He was playing with my niece and nephew and jumping on the trampoline with them. And, you know, my parents kind of gave me that, oh yeah, this is, this is it, you know, like this is, this is who you're meant to be. With. So as much as of course you don't want to make it about your family, we're so close with our families and knowing like how well we got along with Dylan's parents and his family is amazing. And like, it was, it was so nice to see just Dylan fit right in. And it was like, yeah, this is home. Yeah. yeah so we have the like same home. values and mm-hmm. we, we love spending time with our family. And I did feel as if I'd known them for, for so long. It was very, very, very comfortable being, being at her, in her home with her mom and dad and, and sister and, you know, brother-in-law and, and niece and nephew. Mm-hmm. It was just, mm-hmm. it felt very much like the, the home that I grew up in. And, and that was something that just made, made, made the choices very, very easy to make. Yeah. And he had the hardest critic, which was my niece, actually, who's now 15, but at the time she was younger and we've had a very close relationship and she was kind of jealous of Dylan at first because she thought he's going to take my aunt away and she's not going to spend as much time with me. And I said, of course, that's not going to happen. So Dylan actually asked her for permission before he proposed to me. And she was about 11 at the time. Mm -hmm. And she gave, he asked my parents and then he asked my niece and uh, my nephew too, but he was just kind of loved Dylan. He was just like, yeah, I don't care, of course. But my <laughs> niece was the one who was like really concerned about what this meant for our future together. So <laughs> she gave him permission mm-hmm. as she cried a bit, but she was happy and she gave permission. And I thought that was that was really cool for him to do that. And it meant a lot to her. I know that. <laughs> Did she ask you any probing questions before she gave permission, Dylan? Um, the first time you met her, she did. Yeah, I don't think of any <laughs> specific questions. I know she was a she was a fan of a of a of a film I'd done, Descendants. So I, I sort of had a bit of a, an advantage in that respect. Um, but uh, <laughs> she did ask what my favorite color was. Yeah, she asked her favorite color. She asked a couple of like uh, test like questions. Um, but you know, I, awesome. I get it. Yeah, I think she's just very protective of her aunt, and and that makes total sense. And I just wanted her to know that you know she's still your aunt, and she'll still be a big part of your life. And you know, I just uh, I love her very much, and I'll 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 take good care of her. And so I got the nod of approval. I want you to know that as you were describing that scene, I'm picturing the Bachelorette. Yeah. <laughs> the whole town yeah. visit. Yeah. Yeah. It was like that. It was very similar. Yeah. It's pretty much that. Actually, my dad loves that show, which I think it's so funny. And he says he said that to me before I met Dylan. He'd go hometown visits the most important thing before you get serious with anyone if you watch the bachelorette jen you'll see and i'm like are you really comparing the getting advice for the bachelorette he's like it's important mm-hmm. <laughs> oh that is so great and then and you know you gave dylan the final rose so what was the what was the proposal like uh yeah, the proposal is pretty awesome. So as Jen Jen knows, I can't keep secrets very well, but no. I held this one down pretty good. <laughs> I, I had the ring for a while, and um, I had just gotten these new um, film lenses, and, and Jen's into photography. So I rented a uh, I rented a, a boat to go out on Vancouver Harbor, my brother and I, and knowing that she would want to come out and and see the new lenses, uh, I, I texted her and said, hey, Austin and I are going to go out on the water around around three. Uh, if you want to come, that that's awesome. We'll come pick you up. If not, don't worry about it. So I knew that she would for sure say, yes, I'll come. <laughs> and uh, I remember it was like, it was crappy exactly. weather. It was overcast and not very nice. And I just remember thinking, I, I literally sent up a prayer. I said, God, just give me 30 seconds of clear skies. That's all I need. Like, give me 30 <laughs> seconds of it and I'll do it. And I had no clue because he is not good at keeping secrets and he was acting totally normal. So I was like, this is just a boat ride. That's it. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we talked about the fact that we wanted to, you know, get engaged and get married. So I didn't spring it on her. We'd had the trip to Kelowna where I'd asked permission and she knew that that was happening. So she knew something was coming along the line, but she didn't know when. But uh, we got out on the water and Austin had a, a you know bottle of champagne and the camera ready. And I went up to the front of the boat to get the ring out of my pocket. 
And uh, I think Jen thought I was going to the bathroom off the bow because yeah. she had a mouthful of I was snacking. I was almonds. like, oh, I'm just going <laughs> to eat a bunch of snacks. I had like a mouthful of food. <laughs> and uh, yeah, then I, I turned around and, and, and opened the ring. And I, I, I'm i sure I said something very romantic and eloquent. I can't remember what it was because I, I blacked out a little bit. But Me I too. got down on a knee and she's. She said yes, and uh, I think she had grabbed me up in a hug before I could even put the ring on her finger, mm-hmm. but uh, put the <laughs> ring on her finger. And then you know, the, the sky did open up. It was actually kind of a pretty wild moment where it went from gross and raining to skies opened up, the sun came out, and I can't make this up. There was a rainbow that came up after this mm-hmm. after the rain. So yeah. we caught that up in the photographs. So. Yeah, people were like, did you guys Photoshop in that rainbow? We're like, no, it's a real it's rainbow. It's a real <laughs> rainbow, we swear. <laughs> I think yeah. that um, a whole new audience is falling in love with your husband or your husband to be Jen, yeah. uh, because uh, while he's known as being a very charismatic guy, I gather that charm is playing a whole new role in your life, Dylan. Yeah, in a big way. It's really cool. Um, you know, that was a campaign that I really I, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself in the sense that I it, it was a, it's a new venture for me, you know, in a way in a way, being a spokesperson for, for a company, it's something that you want to make sure is true to who you are. And I think you have to be very cognizant of not aligning yourself with a product or a company that could be misconstrued, or, or maybe you could you know find out in the future that their values don't align with yours. And to be presented with a company like Charm that, that has so many good things going for them, not just in the business sense, but in the, in the philanthropic sense. I mean, they really give back and they, they put a lot of value on, on the love behind the product. And, and, you know, that is something that's so special about, uh, about their, their products they are selling, you know, diamond engagement rings and wedding bands and, and, you know, even the necklaces, like so many of these products are purchased by people who want to convey their love for people. And, mm-hmm. and that was something that I found really unique about Charm. And then the comedy element of it with, with Jonathan Torrens and, and Sylvia, like the way that, that the campaign has been structured where it, you know, helps me be myself, which is like, I am a funny person. I do my best to make people laugh. And then, you know, to hybridize that with this really endearing company, um, it was, it was wonderful to see how it all turned out. And then to, to have the, uh, the success of the campaign where I'm getting messages from people saying, I love your, your, your charm commercials are so great. They're so endearing <laughs> and charming and this and that. It's like, it's, it's, uh, it's very humbling and, and I'm very appreciative to be, to be able to, uh, you know, represent that company. Cause I, I believe in the people behind it and I, and I love their products and, mm-hmm. My fiance loves them as well. So. Yeah, I've got uh, some beautiful <laughs> earrings for Christmas and this necklace. And yeah, I was I was surprised and just, yeah, very excited. Actually, Dylan's mom got a pair too. So we we're like little kids in the bathroom after we got them looking in the mirror <laughs> going, oh my gosh, can you believe it? They they planned this together. We we're, were like giggling like little children. We were, we we're just so gorgeous. It was, yeah, <laughs> it was beautiful. They, they look really nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. really cool. So. I, I want to say thank you so much to both of you for taking the time out of your very busy lives yeah. to be with us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, Nancy, yeah, thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. It's so fun to kind of reminisce and go backwards mm-hmm. even with everything that had happened. So yeah, that was, it's a lot of fun. My cheeks are going to hurt from smiling. <laughs> yeah, Someone exactly. Else, sorry. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, when you land back on the East Coast sometime soon, I'll uh, take you to dinner and I'll hear more of your fabulous stories. Great That's to meet you guys. We, we would love that. Tell. Yes. Okay. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank Bye, you so much. Thanks so much for listening to the Canadian Love Map. If you love us, please subscribe and share. We'll be back next week with another love story to add to the map. This podcast is presented and made possible by Charm Diamond Centers. It's hosted by me, Nancy Regan, and is produced and distributed by Podstarter.